And he took a rib out. And then, he, and, then, and then he put that rib, and, and from that rib, he made woman. And he brought her to the man. And, and here's what's really cool. Verse number 23. Then the man exclaimed, At last, my love. I got any E.D. James fans in this house? Come on. Some of you are like, I didn't know that was E.D. James, bro. Get April back up here to sing. I told Steph about that. I said, listen, I'm going to sing it. She's like, don't do it. I said, I'm doing it. I don't care. <laughs> At last. I hope you never can read that scripture the same way again. <laughs> At last, the man exclaimed, this is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Remember that. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. Verse 24, this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and he joins his wife and the two are united as, say it, one. one. Say it again. One. When you get together in marriage, this is not just a contract, but God does something supernatural and he says, these two that were once separated are now one in completion together. It's powerful and beautiful what God does. That's why I don't believe marriage is an institution that man made up. I believe it's something God ordained from the foundations of the earth. It's not just an idea to go and say, well, no, this is just some idea. No, no, this is a God idea that he brought together two that were not complete until they were put together. And the two became one. Now, sometimes what happens when we think about relationship goals is we start thinking of these synthetic unimaginative, creative moments crafted for you to look at. Like if you go look at the hashtags of, uh, hashtag like relationship goals, you will see some obnoxious pictures that are not real life for you in your relationship. Let me show you one of them. Just throw it on screen for them. This is found when you Google hashtag relationship goals. Let's just pretend that we're gonna actually do this in real life. Steph and I are driving home from a snowy day at church. We're coming home. We have our three children in the back. I, I realize it's a perfect element. We stop the car in the middle of a street. We leave it running. We make our oldest get out because someone's gotta take the picture. My eight-year-old has our phone, walks out onto the street, and I tell Steph, let's sit down right here in the middle of the snow and let's take a photo together in this moment. And while we're doing it, let's let our butts become soggy wet because it's snow on the ground. It looks so amazing. And for some of us, it's like, oh, this is what I think of when I think of the perfect relationship. And in all reality, what you need to think about is how wet your butt is in that moment. <laughs> and how dumb you look to everyone else who's driving by saying, what is wrong with these people? This is not hashtag relationship goals. This is a crafted glimpse of fakeness. This is not your real relationship. And if you're not careful, you're going to buy a lie that this is what it's supposed to look like all the time. It is not what it's supposed to look like. Now, listen, we take family photos every year. We love taking family photos. We just do it. When I say we love it, we love the outcome of one great picture out of a hundred that we take. Let me show you Ian, my middle child. He takes the best smiles. He's beautiful. He lights up. Look at this kid. God, that face right there. Ladies, watch out. Come on now. But let me tell you about Ian. Ian, whatever you ask him to do, he decides to do the opposite of it. And this is one photo out of hundreds we took that day because he made up in his mind, I'm going to wear my feelings. Let me just show you what he looked like most of the photos. Right there. Get it. <laughs> I tried to say, Ian, that's how we feel on the inside. We're trying to do this for your mama. Get out there and smile. But the truth is, that's what most of us feel like when we're really walking through our relationships, but we want the first version and want to pretend that's what's really going on. I want to give you permission over the next four weeks to take the mask off. I want to give you permission over the next few weeks to get real about what's going on in your journey. And I don't want you to have a fake, synthetic, everything's good, pretend, stained glass relationship. I want you to have a God-centered relationship that no matter what comes your way, it will not divide what God brought together as one. Amen? Let me, let me just jump into how we can honor God with our relationship, how we can make it last, and how we can actually accomplish this. Over the next four weeks, we're going to cover four different things. We're going to jump in right now with this one. Throw them on the board for me so people can see them. Here's the four things we're going to cover this month. We're going to do this. We're going to start today by learning what it means to be Christ-centered. Say Christ-centered. Christ what that means is even if you call yourself a Christian does not always mean that your life is Christ-centered. 
You and I have got to take a step of faith and say, I life will not just be a bumper sticker and I will call myself a Christian, but my actions and my beliefs and my behaviors will reflect a God that is at the center of my heart. The second thing we're gonna learn next week, we're gonna learn how to be mission driven. Say mission driven. Mission driven means that we as a couple have a mission that God has called us to. We have an assignment from God and we're gonna be on focus. We're gonna care about the things God cares about and we're gonna wreck this world for Jesus with a mission he's called us to live out. Amen. Third thing, we're gonna be devil kicking. Say it, devil kicking. devil kicking. Oh, I can't wait to preach this one. Devil kicking, that we remind the principalities of this earth, we remind the enemy of our life, the devil, that on your best day, you couldn't take me out on my worst day. And that when I've got a relationship that's got a covenant with God and we're together on this thing, we will wreak havoc on your kingdom for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. We're going to learn how to kick the devil into you know where. I ain't going to say it because somebody get mad if I do. Finally, we're going to learn how to be covenant keeping. Say it. We're gonna realize that this is not a contract we signed to get in a marriage, but this is a covenant that God put us in. That this isn't just a convenient thing that we signed up for when it's nice, but we're gonna realize that there's a covenant that God makes that we're gonna keep. But today, we're gonna start this whole thing off with learning what it means to be Christ-centered in our life. Now, if you're here and you're single, if you're here and you're divorced and you're saying, hey, hey, I might need to skip the next few weeks because it's all about people in relationships. I'm gonna tell you this is the most important series of your life. This, and I mean, I'm not trying to speak like too much, too top shelf language. You need to realize that if you eventually want a Christ-centered relationship, if you eventually want hashtag relationship goals that honors God, you gotta take care of you first and you've gotta become Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil-kipping, covenant-keeping as a human being and then you say, God, by me being fully myself single, I'll be ready for the person that you called me for. Instead of looking for Mrs. Wright, I'm gonna become Mr. Wright in my life. And so I'm here to encourage you, if you're single or if you've been divorced, this is a series for you to say, God, put something in me that's not there. So the opportunity you give me to be with somebody, I'm gonna honor you and I'm gonna do it right this time. Amen? Amen. Lean in. This is a powerful series for you as well. So listen, we're gonna jump into what it means to be Christ-centered uh, and what it means. And, and, and I just have a diagram I wanna show you. Every one of us at the center of our life Every one of us at the core of who we are, there is something that drives us. There's something, I, it could be your kids, it could be your lifestyle, it could be money, it could be me, it could be whatever. Every one of us has something that drives the inside of us. I don't know what yours is, you don't know what mine is, but God knows, and it's deep down inside, this thing that just motivates us and drives us. And from that thing, whatever it is, we find that our values and our beliefs come from that place. So whatever it is, our values, what we put value in and what we put belief in. Like, like for me, sometimes in my life, it's been supporting the Cleveland Browns. I don't know why you're laughing. And I have a belief that they're actually gonna win a game. And, it, and, and, and from that belief that they're gonna win a game, there, there's actions and decisions that I make. Go ahead, throw the next one up. It's actions and decisions. And, and I might go buy a ticket for a game because I wanna cheer for my team to win. What I realize is this is a really bad thing for me to put my value in because they will disappoint me every single time. But from my values and my belief leads to my actions and my decisions. And the over time, the actions and decisions that I make create the impact and influence I have on this world. The impact and influence that I have on this world is starts all the way down right here where I say, what is at the center of me? Maybe it is Myself, maybe it's me, maybe it's self. Do you guys have that? Throw it up there. There it is, self. Maybe it's self, me, right there. And from that self, my values and beliefs, it's all about me. I gotta be self-serving. It's gotta be whatever I want it to be. So every relationship I get into, it's about what can I get from this person? What can I take advantage of? I gotta keep me on top and others on the bottom. And what happens is you drive your beliefs and your actions and decisions of what you do from that. And you wonder at the end of your life when you're looking for your friends and loved ones, they're avoiding you because you austernated yourself from all of them. Because you've been so me-focused and self-focused instead of others. You've been selfish, not selfless. And maybe it's your kids for parents. 
Maybe we are so fixated. The kids are the center of our lives. Whatever Johnny wants, Johnny gets. If Johnny's not happy with this, we're going to get him this. If Johnny wants to play basketball and their schedule means every Sunday we miss church, well, Johnny's going to make it to the NBA. Even though I'm 5'8", I think he's going to go somewhere. And we get fixated on this idea that Johnny's got to be happy and Johnny's got to have these good things and Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. And what we realize is from that place, our values of what we value and beliefs come from that. We make our decisions and actions and then we wonder why when Johnny gets 18 and 19, he goes buck wild, doesn't have anything to do anything with God or anything of good because you've made his life about him and he is now self-centered instead of focused on Christ as his savior. Parents, you got to realize that the best thing you can do for your kid is love them the way God's called you to love them and discipline them. Show them the ways of God so that when they're older, they shall not depart from it. Some of us, it's our lifestyle. We have a lifestyle that we're like, man, I can't give up what I have, new cars, new homes, vacations. This, that. I, I want to follow God, but I don't want him to inconvenience me while I'm following him. I'm here to encourage you that you've got to let go of that lifestyle and say, bottom line, whatever it is, could be you, could be kids, could be lifestyle, could be something else. Bottom line, the only thing that's going to really matter at the end of your days is if Christ was the center of who you are. Christ at the center. Because if Christ is at the center, I'm not going to value the things that make the most sense to me. I'm going to value the things that he's taught me in his word. I'm gonna value the things that the Bible teaches me. I'm gonna love the things that the Bible loves. I'm gonna believe in God, not just believe in others and myself. I'm gonna focus my belief on him. From that, my actions and decisions are easy. I'm gonna go God's ways, not others. I'm gonna do what God wants, not what I want. And then finally, you're gonna see the impact and the influence that you're gonna have on your world of being a light in a dark, dark place. If we don't learn how to be Christ-centered at the beginning, Here's the challenge. You're gonna find that you're not gonna have a Christ-centered relationship. If you want a Christ-centered relationship moving forward, you need a Christ-centered lifestyle right now. If you want, hey, moving forward, okay, we want a Christ-centered relationship. Me and my husband, it's been rough. It's been difficult. We want God in the middle of it. Well, guess what? Moving forward, you need to have a Christ-centered lifestyle right now. You need to start saying the decisions I make are what Christ wants me to to do. Listen, if you don't build your life on righteousness for the future, your foundation of, you'll have a foundation of sin today. If you don't build your life of righteousness for the future, you don't build it on a foundation of sin today. You just don't do it. You've got to decide, hey, I'm going to follow Christ in my ways, not follow my own ways. You can't say, well, I want this foundation of righteousness in the future when you're building on a foundation of sin today. So you might be asking if you're in a relationship right now, how do we do that, Doug? How do we actually go through and make this happen? Me and my spouse, we want a Christ-centered relationship. In, in the past, I would give you a whole bunch of things to do. I would have been like, do this, do this, do this, do this. I realized the more things I ask you to do, the less likely it is for you to actually do it. And so I'm gonna give you one thing. Say one. I'm gonna give you one thing that I'm gonna ask you to do and I'm gonna ask you to commit to this and see what God will do. I believe this one thing has the highest return on investment is that if you commit to this one thing, the rest of the things will begin to follow. This one thing will start a chain reaction to other things that God wants to see happen in your life. And the one thing I'm asking you to do is learn how to pray together daily. Say it with me. Pray together daily. Say it one more time. Pray together. Now, for some of y'all, you're like, dude, stop the tape. Rut row. Pastor, you don't understand. Like, when I, well, prayer is very private to me. Prayer is very, in, like, I don't know, I don't know what she prays. Uh, she doesn't know what I pray, vice versa. Like, we probably should keep that personal. That's me and God, not like me, her, and God. Like, we just kind of need to do this. I'm here to encourage you that you've got to be willing to get uncomfortable a little bit to grow as a human being. Like you've got to be willing to step out of your comfort zone to grow to something new. And for some of you who think it's too private to pray with your spouse, don't raise your hands, don't participate in what I'm about to say next. But I want you to think about if you've ever seen your spouse using the bathroom. Now, my mom taught me early on in life that when you go potty, it's private. Doors are supposed to be closed. No one else is supposed to be in that space. That's you alone. And when I got married, uh, apparently someone else in our relationship didn't get that memo. 
And next thing you know, I, I walk into situations or I'm, do, I'm in a situation and somebody wants to come in and have a conversation. And I'm like, no, 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 private. She's like, what's, so big, what's, what's the big deal? We're married. I'm like, ah. And I can concede number one. I can concede number one. We are not doing this during number two, okay? This is not happening on, um, not on my watch, friends. But some of y'all, listen, let's just be real about it. You know you've seen your partner use the bathroom. You're like, man, he's so cringy. You know it, though. You've swapped spit with this person. You've swapped other things that we're going to say PG-13 about on this with this person. My point is this. You do private things in front of your spouse. Your spouse has seen you in situations that if it leaked, you would not be happy it leaked. My point is this, if you can do these things, why can we not do spiritual things? Why can we not? Listen, when you commit to praying together, what you're doing is you are starting to build what I would call a spiritual bond between the two of you. You have physical bonds when you're married. You have emotional bonds when you're married. And I'm gonna here to tell you, you need spiritual bonds when you are married. And it starts by praying together daily. Say it one more time. Pray together daily. Pray together daily. So often we miss, and let, let me just say this. I believe that if I was the devil and I was your enemy and my job was to rob, steal, and kill and destroy you from your life and your purpose, the number one thing I would do is not let spouses, not let people who are married get bonded together spiritually. Because if you two really become one and you really bond spiritually this way, listen, I'm gonna tell you right now, you will never be mission-driven if you're not first Christ-centered and bonded spiritually. Like if you're not bonded spiritually, you're never gonna get on mission together. You guys are gonna be arguing about things and not thinking this is it. You're not gonna hear from God together because you're not first Christ-centered and bonded spiritually. So that's not gonna happen. I promise you, you're not gonna be devil kicking. When the devil shows up to wreak havoc, you're gonna be sucking your thumb, hoping something happens. Versus standing up and saying, no, 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 not in this house. For me and my house, we serve the Lord together. Go ahead and get up out of here with that noise. I promise you, you'll be sucking your thumb if you ain't spiritually bonded. You'll be crying out, why is this happening? Versus taking authority over what you can take authority over. You're not going to be devil kicking if you're not Christ-centered first, mission-driven. And I promise it's going to be really hard to be covenant-keeping if you're not spiritually bonded. It's going to be really hard to be covenant keeping. You're going to look at it like a contract. What's benefiting me right now? Versus saying, no, 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 this is a covenant before God himself. If we don't get this right, and I believe we start it by praying together daily. I want to give you really quickly three ways that we can do that. Three ways that we can pray together daily. So I can help you this week get started on this. Number one, keep it short. Number one, keep it short. Now listen, I'm not saying it has to stay short. It's like start where you are. Just don't stay there. You, you don't have to always just make it short, but you should keep it short when you're getting started. 60 seconds maybe, 30 seconds maybe, just saying together we're gonna do this. We're gonna grab hands, we're gonna, we're gonna hold hands, and we're gonna pray right now together in this moment. We, we, I know it can feel awkward, but if you give it time, watch how much you start feeling like, God, you're connecting us together. Those secret sins, men, you know, those secret sins that you might have on a screen that you don't want your wife to see. Maybe women, there's some things going on in your life that you want your husband to see. It's so interesting when you involve God in it and you connect hands and you invite him in that room, some things you don't want to do anymore because you're getting so bonded to your spouse. You're like, no, 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 I'm hurting them. I don't want to hurt them anymore because we're in this thing together. Together. Get, keep it short. The second thing I want you to do is this. I want you to keep it consistent. I want you to keep it consistent. My wife and I can show you in our house the hallway that goes to our garage. Every morning when we're taking the kids to school, I drive the boys to school. They're running around like, like they're like gremlins who got water on them. They're just like everywhere. We're like, get out the house, go. We got to get you to school. And Stephanie will grab my hand right at that moment and she'll say, come on, we got to pray. And I go, thank you, Jesus. And we pray. It might be 30 seconds. It might be a couple minutes. I don't know. But we're just going to pray in that we keep it consistent, same time, every day. We pray at dinner as a family every day. We do it every day together. And the final thing is this. If you miss a day, don't miss two. If you miss a day, do not miss two. Let's say you forgot yesterday. Don't just give up on it. And you're like, okay, okay, we forgot yesterday. Let's get back on it. Let's do it. Come on, we're going to be a family that is Christ-centered. 
This relationship is going to have Christ in the middle of it, and we're not going to stop praying together daily. And it's going to become so part of our lives that we are going to think, how did we do life before this? It's going to become so part of our life. We're going to say, how did we survive our marriage before this? And then I believe once Christ is that center, like we're talking about, you're going to be mission-minded. You're going to find ways to kick that devil's bootay. And you're going to say, man, no matter what in our life, we're going to keep this covenant. Steph, are you here? Steph, can you join me on stage? Steph and I, we don't have a perfect marriage. She's still working on it. I'm... <laughs> What did I say? I, I'm still working on it. I said, I'm still working on it. <laughs> There's times where she's so mad at me that she's ready to beat me up. <laughs> There's times where she comes back crawling on her hands and knees to me <laughs> to, to look under the bed to say, get out and fight like a man, you sissy. <laughs> like what I did there, wasn't that funny? That was good. <laughs> but here's the truth. When we lock hands in the morning and we pray, we say, God, we don't know what this day has. We don't know what's all going on. But we're just trusting you. And sometimes I pray for her because I can tell that she might be one of those mammals who wants to eat her young. You ever see those mammals on Animal Planet? Could be game over for a ginger baby. <laughs> in her days, she says, Doug, quit worrying. Let God take care of it. Doug, quit worrying. Worship. Steph, I don't want to hear that right now. I'm worried. But I know it's good. I needed to hear it. So there's a prayer. I want to throw it on the screen. I want to throw it, if they can put it up there for you. Look, here's a prayer that you can pray this week. I'm going to post it online later. Dear God, give us wisdom and clear direction in all we do today. Help us show your love to each other and shine your light to the, into this world. Keep us close to you away from temptation, and always in your will. In the name of Jesus, amen. What'd that take, 30 seconds? We gotta pray together daily. So we wanna pray for you. We wanna believe God for you. And I just believe that this is a start. Don't miss these four weeks. Let's go on this journey together. And let's have relationships that honor God and relationships that will last. Amen? Would you pray, Steph? Would you, can you pray for him? Did your mic work? Yeah. Would you just bring your forgiveness, bring your peace and your restoration? And Lord, would you help us and teach us and show us how to center our lives around you? You're the one thing that matters more than anything else in this world. And when we center our lives around you, we'll find that everything else will fall into place. We thank you for who you are and your strength and your goodness and your favor to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do me a favor. Keep your eyes closed just for a moment. Eyes closed for a moment. I just feel led that if there's somebody in here who isn't yet Christ-centered, you've been going through your life, you've been going through the motions, you've been trying to figure it out, and you showed up today for some reason somehow, I'm here to tell you that you did not come here on accident, that Jesus has a plan for your life, he died on the cross for your sin, and he's desperate for a relationship with you. I'm here with your head bowed and eyes closed. If you're here and you don't know this Jesus that I'm talking about, or maybe you followed him a long time ago, but you've drifted from him and you're ready to come back, you're ready to say yes to him, I want to give you an opportunity for a fresh start to turn from your ways and turn towards God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you down front. I just want to pray with you. The reason I'm asking you to raise your hand is because it's the international sign of surrender. When you don't speak the same language as your enemy, you lift your hand when you surrender. You might be saying, wait a minute, Doug, what are you talking about enemies? I thought this God you're talking about loves me. He does, but our sin separated us from his love. But Jesus made a way where there was no way. And if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our hearts that he is Lord, then the Bible says that we shall be saved. So I'm gonna ask you to make the boldest decision of your life. I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand and say, that's me. I want to say yes to Jesus today to make him my Lord. When I count to three, don't let fear paralyze you. Let your faith have movement. One, 
two, three. Shoot up your hands right now. God bless you. God bless you. Keep your hands up just for a moment because I've got some volunteers that are moving through the room and they want to give you a gift. We want to help you go from a one-time decision to a lifetime disciple. So we want to resource you and give you a a tool to help you on that journey. So just keep your hand up until you get that gift. God bless you. So many hands up. God bless you. Do me a favor. Keep that hand up until you get that gift. Now listen, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one lost sinner comes home. That means all of heaven parties when somebody comes home to Jesus. And here at Rust City, we might not be good at a lot of things, but we're really good at partying. And so we're going to pray with you out loud as you say this prayer. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me as you are coming home to heaven today. Would everyone repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I ask you to be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin and give me a fresh start. I confess that I need you and I make you Lord. Teach me how to live for you all the days of my life. In your name I pray, amen, amen.